Chapter 11. Confederalism The broad principle of political and social organization that can institutionalize interdependence without resorting to a state and at the same time preserve the power of municipal assemblies is confederalism. A confederation is a network in which several political entities combine to form a larger whole. Although a large entity is formed in the process of confederating, the smaller entities do not dissolve themselves into it and disappear. Rather, they retain their freedom and identity and their sovereignty even as they confederate. In an ecological society, the municipalities that have undergone democratization, that is, whose charters have been changed so that citizens' assemblies hold the supreme political power within the municipality, would form confederations on a regional basis to address transmunicipal or regional concerns. These confederations would institutionalize the inherent interdependence of communities without depriving them of their freedom and sovereignty. Instead of a central government with a legislature voting to approve or reject laws, a confederation is typically embodied in a congress of delegates that coordinates policies and practices of the member communities. In a libertarian municipalist polity, the municipalities would form such confederations by sending delegates to them. These delegates would not be representatives, that is, their purpose would not be to make policies or laws on behalf of their supposedly benighted constituents in ways that they imagine to be beneficial to them. Instead, the delegates would be mandated by the people in their municipal assemblies to carry out their wishes. The delegates' functions would be to convey the wishes of the municipality to the confederal level. In conjunction with other delegates in the confederation, they would coordinate policies to meet common ends that the several member communities have agreed upon and adjudicate any differences that may arise among themselves. All delegates would be accountable to the assemblies that have mandated them as their agents. Confederations in history Confederal structures, it should be emphasised, are not historically novel. To the contrary, early cities at the dawn of recorded history established confederal associations, as they did in the ancient Mediterranean and medieval European worlds. In early modern times, confederations gained notable importance as a major viable alternative to the nation-state before the nation-state attained the prevalence that it has today. Insofar as cities have resisted the encroachments of the state, they have often done so by joining together to form confederations. We saw several examples of cities forming leagues and confederacies in Chapter 5, but two important cases that have not yet been mentioned are those of Switzerland and Castile in Spain. Today, Switzerland because it is still a confederation, seems anomalous among the relatively more unitary nation-states of Europe. But in earlier times, in Central Europe especially, it was confederations that were the norm and states that were the anomaly. Confederations abounded in the 13th and 14th centuries, like the Rhenish and Swabian leagues. Switzerland merely preserved much of this older confederal trend, while its neighbours underwent centralisation to become more modern states. Its government structure is still relatively decentralised, made up of 22 cantons, which still have a great deal of autonomy from the federal level. In turn, the 3,000 communes still have some autonomy from the cantons in which they are located. But Switzerland today also has many state features, as well as attitudes, institutions and social features that are not all enlightened. Swiss confederalism is far more interesting historically. Most strikingly, in the country's easternmost territory, which was once called Raetia by the Romans and is now called the canton of Graubünden, the Swiss communes formed confederations for their common welfare and safety. At the beginning of the 16th century in Raetia, three confederal leagues the Gotteshausbund, the Oberbund, or Grauerbund, Zen Gerichtenbund, coexisted. In 1524, these three leagues allied to form the free state of the three leagues, which, despite its statist name, 
was a confederation. The Free State Confederation lasted for almost three centuries until Napoleon forced it into the Swiss Confederation in 1803. All three of its component leagues, in turn, were made up of communes that were remarkably democratic and free. Indeed, the ultimate sovereignty in the Free State reposed with the communes, which held assemblies much like town meetings and would give them assent or opposition to a proposed course of action by referendum. They controlled their own judicial and economic affairs, as well as the local police and military forces, and they functioned along surprisingly communistic lines, using local resources in ways that approximated collective ownership. For example, they privileged the right to graze cattle communally. In a pastoral economy, common grazing such as they practiced amounted to overriding private property, and negating private land ownership. The only central government in the Free State Confederation was a commission consisting of the respective heads of each of the three leagues and an elective assembly, which together proposed referenda and carried out the will of the communes. The commissioners had the right to handle foreign affairs and to prevent the component leagues from making foreign alliances of their own but the communes themselves decided upon matters of war and peace, as well as domestic issues. The central government thus had almost no power, while the communes, that is the citizens themselves in assembly, had a great deal. In effect, the commissioners were merely attendants upon the people. Ultimately, they lost to the communes even the power to handle diplomacy and make treaties. In general, the history of Raetia for these three centuries is a striking testimony to the ability of direct democratic communities to govern themselves in confederal union. In 16th century Castile, confederalism was part of a revolutionary struggle. In 1520, Toledo's city council became upon all the cities represented in the Cortes to establish a common front against the royal government, which had made an unfavourable change in its tax policy. City after city in Castile went into a full-scale revolt. They organised civic militias and democratised their municipal governments. A national junta, the equivalent of a confederal council, was established with delegates from all the Cortes cities, constituting a dual power in opposition to the royal administration. Mustering an army of citizens and adding to it professional soldiers, this Comunero Junta won military victories that threatened to replace the monarchical state with the municipal confederation. The concrete aims of the Comunero movement were municipal democracy and a Cortes composed of city delegations that would greatly limit royal authority. The movement's so-called Valladolid Articles demanded that Cortes delegates be chosen with the consent of the parishes, that is, by assemblies of the people rather than by city councils. These delegates, in turn, were to be guided by the mandate of the electors and were obliged to take their instructions from their home cities. The Cortes was expected to meet regularly and address all grievances before closing. Had these demands been realised, Castile would have seen the emergence of a broadly based local democracy, one deeply rooted in city neighbourhoods as well as towns. After a demanding conflict, however, that included the siege of Toledo, the state prevailed over the confederations when the king militarily defeated the very popular Comuneros. Confederal Organisation in an ecological society, the direct democratic municipal assemblies would elect their delegates to serve on a confederal council. This council would be a congress of the delegates from the various municipal assemblies. Like the commission in the Swiss example, the council would have little power of its own, but would merely carry out the will of the municipalities. Moreover, the delegates would be strictly mandated to vote according to the wishes of their home municipalities, which would give them rigorous instructions in writing. They would not be permitted to make policy decisions without their home municipalities' specific instructions. Entirely responsible to the citizens' assemblies, 
the delegates would be recallable in the event that they violated a mandate. Rather than making policy decisions in their own right, the Confederal Council would exist primarily for administrative purposes. That is, for the purpose of coordinating and executing policies formulated by the assemblies. Policy making versus administration. Fundamental to libertarian municipalism is the distinction between policy making and the execution of those policies, or between policy making and administration. At the municipal level, the citizens in their democratic assemblies would make policy. They would deliberate on the various courses of action open to them in a particular issue, then decide which one to take. Suppose an assembly was debating whether to build a road. After weighing the pros and cons of building the road, the citizens might vote that the road was necessary. Their decision to build it is an example of policy making. The road could be built over any of several routes. The engineers in the community would devise plans for the various possibilities, solving any technical problems that might arise with each, then bring those plans to the assembly. There, the engineers would lay the alternatives before the citizens, explaining each one clearly. Few of the citizens in the community would likely know how to build a road, but then such expertise would not be necessary for them to have. It would merely be necessary that they understand clear explanations and the differences among the plans. Most important, the engineers would not be the ones to decide which road to build, except in their capacity as citizens. They would simply function as a panel of experts. After debating the strengths and weaknesses of each plan, it is the citizens, including the experts in their capacity as citizens, who would choose their preference. This choice is another example of policy making. Finally, the road itself would have to be constructed. Unlike the other stages of the process, the construction of the road would be strictly an administrative responsibility. It would require no deliberation, no voting. The road builders would carry out the decision made by the assembly, building the road according to the chosen plan. This strictly technical process of execution is an example of administration, in which no policy making is involved. In a libertarian municipalist polity, as in our world today, many decisions require that the decision makers consider a multitude of complex and difficult factors. But then as now, technical knowledge is usually not necessary for making political choices. Few parliamentarians today would be able to design a nuclear power plant or even know how one works. But that does not bar them from making policy decisions about the use of nuclear energy. In a libertarian municipalist society, the knowledge that is needed would be disseminated as widely as possible among the citizenry. Technical issues should be presented clearly and accessibly so that ordinary citizens of reasonable competence can make policy decisions concerning them, guaranteeing that all matters of policy are the province of reasonable, competent citizens will help to preserve a clear and institutionalised distinction between policy making and administration thereby making direct democracy feasible. Karl Marx, in his analysis of the Paris Commune of 1871, did radical social theory a considerable disservice when he celebrated the fact that the Commune had combined delegated policy-making with the execution of policies by its own administrators. In fact, this merging of the two functions was actually a major failing of that body. When the people who are administrators come to make policy decisions as well, the groundwork for a state has been laid, an elite is in the process of usurping the citizens' decision-making power. As we have seen in the early period of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, the select boards, which are supposed to perform only administrative functions, actually made policy decisions as well, arrogating for themselves the powers that rightfully belonged to the town meetings. When such administrative bodies are permitted to function outside public scrutiny, they can make policy decisions surreptitiously and cloak themselves as administrative or practical matters. Articulating and preserving the distinction between the two functions, however, will assure, as much as humanly possible, that administrators make only administrative decisions, not policies. 
confederal referenda. In the new city as envisaged here, policy making would be the exclusive privilege of the municipal assemblies, of free citizens voting in a direct democracy. The functions of the confederal council would be purely administrative and coordinative, executing the policies that the municipalities have adopted. One process that the confederation council would coordinate would be confederation-wide voting. Suppose again that one member community of the confederation was wrecking ecological mayhem, dumping its wastes in the river, or violating human rights, excluding people of colour. One or more of its fellow municipalities could propose that all the member municipalities vote on whether that community may persist in its noxious practice. The Confederation Council would coordinate what amounted to a confederal referendum in which, if they so chose, the municipalities could vote that that community desist from its malfeasance. The voting by majority rule would be tallied according to the popular vote, not by municipal jurisdiction. Each delegate to the Confederal Council would carry a tally of the positive and negative votes from his or her municipality. The aggregate votes of all the citizens of all the municipalities in the Confederation would be added together to determine the final outcome. Such a process would represent not a denial of democracy, but the assertion of a shared agreement by the majority of citizens within the Confederation that the ecological integrity of a region or human rights must be maintained. It would not be the Confederal Council that made this decision, but the cumulative majority of all the citizens in all the assemblies conceived in the aggregate as one large community that expressed its wishes through the Confederation. On many issues, referenda need not demand an answer of either yes or no. In today's referenda, conducted by and for the nation-state, people have a very limited choice they may vote either yes or no in the referendum, as it has been formulated in advance. But in the Confederation of Municipalities, an assembly may decide during its period of deliberation and debate that it cares for neither option and prefers to formulate its own. In such a case, the confederated municipalities may eventually choose from a range of options presented rather than voting to accept or reject only one. Assembly Supremacy Even as they possess the power to prevent a particular municipality from inflicting moral or physical damage on its own members or on other towns or cities, the municipalities would have the ultimate power within the confederation. It is they, collectively, that would reign supreme as the formulators of policy. The principle of assembly sovereignty is what distinguishes the libertarian municipalist approach from statism, a radical anti-capitalist party that captured the existing apparatus of a nation-state but merely went on to reconstitute another state, might well abolish private property and take over the means of production, but such a state would not constitute a direct democracy. Its power over people would undoubtedly grow, and if recent experience is any guide, become all-encompassing, reinforcing its state power with economic power. It would undoubtedly develop a large bureaucracy to administer its comprehensive controls. Whatever its success in restraining capitalism, such a statist trajectory could well prove disastrous. Consciously formed to accommodate interdependencies, consciously formed to accommodate interdependencies by contrast, a confederation of municipalities would be based on the full accountability of confederal delegates the right to recall and firm mandates. As such, the Confederation would unite municipal democratic decision-making with trans-municipal administration. Most significantly, the Confederation of Municipalities could fulfil the long-standing dream of revolutionary movements past to achieve, quote, the commune of communes, unquote.